Luke chapter 10 at verse 38. Just kind of remind you what's been going on in this chapter. Again, a lot of things goes on. He has sent out the 70 earlier in chapter verses or chapter 10 verses 1 through 12. And he had pronounced judgment. One of the things I tried to bring out is, is that Jesus did come to give us grace, but he also is a God of justice. And we need to understand that one day we will all stand before him and we will be judged. And we need to make sure that we are where we need to be and uh, how important it is that we do that. I see Jesus taught on the earth. He was very blunt, very, very uh, emphatic on a lot of occasions about people's need to repent and people's need to change their lives and get their focus back on God. We, we talked about the ideal of how Jesus rejoiced in the spirit. And then we closed up with the idea of the parable of the Good Samaritan. And, and I think, again, and I've shared this with you so many times, and I just continue to remind Jesus to do this as you're reading through the Bible. A lot of times, don't stop at a chapter or eight, but just try to go on. And isn't it interesting that right after that, after he had told the parable of the Good Samaritan, we then are seeing him being invited to the home of Mary and Martha and Lazarus. And this is the one passage in the scripture that I think a lot of times a lot of the ladies associate with because this is one of those passages that always are brought up in, in ladies' classes and everything about how ladies have a very important part. Women have a very important part in what they do. And sometimes church work, our everyday life, friends, neighbors, we become so bogged down in all the details and the minutia of life that we forget what's really important. So we start off in chapter 10 at verse 38 this evening, and it happened as they went that he entered a certain village, and a certain woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. It's interesting as you look at a lot of times when Martha and Mary and Lazarus are mentioned, of course we remember in Luke John 11, Lazarus is the, the key guy, but most of the time when their names are mentioned together, Martha's always the one that's mentioned first. And it may very well be because maybe she was the oldest person in the family. And so a lot of commentators suggested the idea that maybe the house that they lived in belonged to Martha. And so she was the one always taking charge because she was the older person. She was the older uh, sibling there in that situation. Some people think that she may have been a widow. Some even have gone so far as to say that uh, it may have been Simon the leper. I don't know where they got that idea. I don't see anything in scripture that kind of leads toward that. Sometimes we read stuff in scripture that we shouldn't read, and we all have to be very careful about that. Uh, the bottom line is, is that he, they were invited, his, Jesus and his disciples were invited into this house with Mary and Martha. And notice, as you look at this, he well, she welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, who sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. And verse 40 is important. It's kind of the theme of everything that happened. And Martha was distracted with much serving. The Greek word here for distracted, interestingly enough, could be translated like this. She was running around in circles trying to make sure everything was taken care of. And that's kind of what was going on here. She wanted to be the perfect host. She wanted to the very best of her ability to, to serve Jesus. And, and that was her way of doing it, actually doing what she could to serve Jesus. And that's a, that's a beautiful picture. And again, I've seen so many ladies in, in the church here at South Cobb and in other places that whenever the chips come down, whenever somebody's in need, they're always cooking, they're always bringing food to people. I remember how shortly after uh, many of you heard about Shane, many of you brought food. And, and again, I, I, we appreciate that so very, very much. A lot of times we guys think about it, but that's about as far as it gets. Maybe sometimes we might actually think about going to maybe, but it's not gonna be like, we're gonna cook nothing I'll pick you up something at Chick-fil-A and bring it to your house or something like that. We, we're not going to go into all the details that the ladies do. I could just see Martha running around frustrated because it seems like that she's doing all the work. Mary's just sitting there listening to Jesus. 
and she gets frustrated about it. And so she, she approached him, the Bible says, and she said, Lord, don't you care? Do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her to help me. It's a simple request. It's a, it's a, it's a good request. I mean, you think about it in that respect that, that, you know, she kind of felt like she was doing it all. There are ladies that, again, I know that sometimes I see the frustration in their face because it seems like they, they feel like they do it all. But look at her heart. You know, you think about the situation. She wanted this to be perfect. Jesus was there. And again, there's a lot of debate, obviously not, but some people think that maybe this actually happened after Jesus had raised Lazarus from the dead. I don't think so. I still think we're talking about six months out at least. And what we read in John chapter 11, Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead uh, as he was in Jerusalem. So in, in Bethany, in that area there. So the idea is, is that she was very, very concerned. It was a simple, you know, it could have been a simple meal. But maybe again, because this was a well-known rabbi, as far as a lot of other people, she wanted everything to be perfect. And, and again, I think about how every woman wants everything to be perfect whenever they invite somebody home. The house has got to be clean. The food's got to be just right. Uh, all of these things have to happen. How many of you remember, as we went through the evangelism workshop, Rob Whitaker always made the point, you got to eat. And one of the things that I was impressed with is the fact that he's thinking about, as Rob was thinking about winning souls and things along that line, I wondered if he thought maybe a little bit about this situation with Mary and Martha and Lazarus taking care of Jesus. Yes, you do have to eat. And perhaps Mary and Martha and Lazarus had all had a part in in inviting Jesus over to eat food with them so that they can enjoy that close fellowship. Jesus looked at it as another opportunity to teach. And again, how desperately we need to invite people to our houses, to teach them the gospel. And here's this opportunity. She's sitting at Jesus' feet, Mary is, hearing the word. Martha, again, Bless her heart, she, she's just, she's got the wrong priorities. Jesus was feeding them spiritual food. She was concerned about the physical food. And again, I appreciate ladies so very, very much. I was thinking about that in that respect. But ladies, whenever you are doing this and whenever you're working so hard, as you often do, to invite people to your house and you want to make sure everything is just as perfect as it could be, you know, always remember that eating the food that Jesus gives us is that much more important. Jesus, Jesus did not condemn her. He said, listen, Martha, you are worried and troubled about many things. I don't know exactly how the tone of voice that he used, but I think he was speaking to her softly. I don't know that he even spoke to her in front of everybody. Maybe she went back to another room to get some food and he walked back there with her and maybe talked with her. I don't know how the circumstances really played out. The Bible doesn't tell us that. But can't you see him maybe taking her aside and saying, look, I know you're worried about this. I know you're concerned about making all of these things going on. And, and the word troubled here <clears throat> suggests the idea uh, of being frustrated and aggravated. Think about sometimes whenever you're frustrated and aggravated, it has a tendency to cut off any listening. We, we, we're aggravated with things. We're, we're not listening to what somebody else says as much as we're frustrated and we want everybody to know how we feel at that moment in time. Sometimes have we allowed our frustrations to cause us to no longer to listen to God's word. Sometimes have we allowed our frustrations to... to turn from hearing God's word. All these things have to be taken into consideration. We have to think about this and try to put ourselves in these places as we're, we're looking at this. They are worried. She was worried about many things, but notice verse 42, one thing. This one thing is needed. And Mary has chosen the good part, 
which will not be taken away from her. Whenever we're eating, you know, whenever we eat our meals at night, that's, that's a great thing. But guess what we're going to have to do first thing in the morning? We're going to have to eat again, right? We're going to have to eat. We're going to have to eat sometime during the next day to keep our bodies going and keep going and doing everything we've got to do. We've got to think about the ideal, and I think that's the point Jesus was trying to really get across, is look, yes, it's important to eat, to have fellowship, to spend time with people, but you need to make sure that you're, more, you're, you're eating the important things, the word of God. You're feasting upon that. You need to be building up your spirit, not just having the opportunities to have fellowship, but building up your spirit. And what better place in the world can we build up our spirit than around others that are like-minded, that, that are studying and trying to grow closer to Jesus themselves? We talk a lot about our fellowship meals. And, you know, I think that's one thing that we've missed a lot in 2020 because we, we didn't get, a, get together with the fellowship meals that much because of the uh, danger of spreading COVID. But think about this idea that what if we, at the same time, we do get together during our Bible classes and so forth to study God's word. But, you know, what if we at our fellowship meals would not only talk about what's going on in one another's life, that's vital. That's so vital. But if we spend some time talking about how are you doing spiritually? You know, when you're talking with somebody across the table, that's close communion. That's close fellowship. How are you doing spiritually? What can I do to help you? Is there some way that I might be able to encourage you? You know, all these things need to come into play here. And I think that's, again, what's going on here. Love, as she's learning from Jesus, she's learning that love must cling to the things of the spirit. Yes, we're going to get hungry. Yes, from time to time, we need that extra fellowship with other people. But we also have to realize that the more important things is that communion with God, studying his word. And then, as we're going to see a, kind of as a segue into chapter 11, the importance of prayer. Mary and Martha, Mary had it figured out. Martha, perhaps maybe after the Lord gently, kindly rebuked her, Maybe now she was going to concentrate on what was really important as well. And I wonder if maybe again, running around, trying to take care of everything, she, after Jesus said those words, if she didn't finally just say, if any of you want anything, go in the kitchen and get it. I don't know if they had a kitchen. I don't know how it played out. But if anything wanted, go ahead and get it. I'm going to sit here and listen to Jesus myself. How important is it? Oh, how important is that? Again, she was frustrated and aggravated, and now she's learning her priorities. And so now she's understood, first things first. Luke is the only one that records this. And there's so much, there's so much here. It contrasts in a sense with the parable of the Good Samaritan, which emphasized service to humanity. Remember that? The Good Samaritan was the guy who served this man that was beaten up on the side of the road. But isn't it interesting that right after that, Luke then records about how Martha became so enraptured or so concerned about serving humans that she forgot what was really important to her soul was to sit down and listen to Jesus too. And so Jesus, you know, recognizes the need for hospitality, but he also corrected Martha because of her fretfulness and fussiness, you know. Sometimes hospitality gets in the way of spiritual things. Sometimes something good gets in the way of the spiritual. And so we need to understand that the kingdom of God is not food and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit, Romans 14, verse 17. Again, the preaching of the word is what's vital because we're trying to get people to a heavenly home how many times have we fed the stomach, but we've starved the soul? And how important is it that we really, really key in on what's important? So isn't it interesting that you find that parable of the Good Samaritan helping humanity, and then, hey, even doing that sometimes can cause us to miss what is really important in our lives and in our following Jesus. One of the hardest things to do in the Christian life, I'm going to be honest with you, and I think all of us could know this, one of the hardest things we will ever do in the Christian life, 
is learning to find a balance. Learning to find a balance. Because we can serve others to the point to where so, we're so exhausted that we can't do anything else. The other thing is, is that we could get to the point to where we're feeding ourselves so much spiritually that we're not taking it to others. It's, it's all about balance. And how hard is that to do? And it's true, not just when it comes to our spiritual lives, but, but everything else, right? We get carried away so often. Uh, football, basketball, baseball, you, you name it, our, our goals, our ideas. We get carried away with all this stuff and we lose sight of what's really important. Jesus kindly reminds all of us, make sure that you're feasting upon the word of God Carve out that time every day to spend in God's word. Spend that time in prayer. Communicate with God. And that's, as I said earlier, that's what he begins to talk about next in Luke chapter 11. It came to pass, as he was praying in a certain place, that he ceased, that one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John also taught his disciples. So he said to them, when you pray, say, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us day by day your daily bread, our daily bread, and, and forgive us our sins as we also forgive everyone who's indebted to us. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. We remember that this particular prayer is also quoted again in Matthew, the sixth chapter in the Sermon on the Mount. So this is something that Jesus had taught here in this particular context, again, to his disciples. Maybe they needed this because as I thought about it and as I've studied it myself, I think the Sermon on the Mount kind of sets the tone for Jesus' ministry as he begins his ministry. So maybe here was an opportunity as he's coming close to the end of his ministry that Jesus, again, is trying to remind his disciples about how important it is to keep that relationship with God. Jesus, often in the book of Luke, got out to the idea of <clears throat> prayer. Uh, somebody asked a question just now, is the daily bread referring, referencing the word? It very well could be. It, it very well could be, um, especially in light of the context as we're looking at here in Luke chapter 10, going on into chapter 11 reminding ourselves of the fact that it was not broken up into chapters and verses all the way through here. So it very well could be talking about that daily bread of the word, but it also could be meaning the, the physical bread that we often eat. So again, how important it is it just as important it is for us to eat our daily meals, our breakfast, lunch, and supper, if we have that, is vital that we spend time in the word and eat his word so that we can build ourselves spiritually. Notice, as you begin this prayer, the disciples are asking to be taught to pray. Notice, he said, teach us to pray. Now, again, in other passages in the, in, in, through the book of Luke, or excuse me, in other places, we do find, teach us how to pray. And a lot of times when we read that, sometimes maybe we add that word when we're looking at Luke's account. But in Luke, he doesn't say, teach us how to pray. He just teach, says, teach us to pray. And I think there is kind of a difference there. Yes, we need to know how, but yes, we even more need to discipline ourselves to pray. How important is prayer in your life? I mean, do you get up in the morning praying? Do you go to bed at night praying? Do you pray through the day? Um, we joke a lot about it. You know, a lot of prayers are said. When you're driving around to Atlanta, you've got to pray a lot, right? There's a lot, just a lot that we talk about in that respect. But I like the fact that he's teaching him. And now notice something else here. He was praying and his, one of his disciples said, Lord, teach us to pray as John also taught his disciples. This John is probably John the Baptist. It seemed like at that particular time, it was usual practice among most of the more famous rabbis at that time to give teaching on prayer. And a lot of times they will give them rote prayers, as it was, prayers that they would write down to, to begin to help people to learn how to pray. And, and maybe, maybe, oh, and as you listen to these disciples of these rabbis, 
you could pretty well tell who they were following by the prayers that they prayed. If they prayed publicly in a synagogue, you could tell if they were following a certain rabbi because they would be repeating those same kind of rabbi, those prayers those rabbis would be teaching them. It may be that they were asking Jesus to teach them what to say and how to say it so that everybody could recognize them as Jesus' disciples. Oh, prayer was such an important thing back then, and, and it's, it became a highly formalized thing in the first century. The, many of the rabbis would pray publicly so that everybody could talk about, and Jesus condemned that in the Sermon on the Mount. Don't, don't, when you pray, get into your closet that you may pray between you and God alone, he would say. You don't pray publicly, and, and you, know, you don't do it to have everybody talk about what a beautiful prayer you pray. Uh, the seemed to be at that time, and there were three times a day when the Jews of the first century would make formal prayers. Acts chapter 10 at verse 9 references this. So they would wear their prayer shawl, they would have their flag tree on, and they would always turn toward Jerusalem to pray. Okay, and again, think about it in this respect. Um, uh, Islam, Muslims turn toward Mecca whenever they're praying their prayers. So you kind of see the same going, thing going on, and, and especially if you were in Jerusalem, you would know where the Holy of Holy was, and that was the representation of where God was. So this is why they would be praying in this way. So they would say certain prayers. They would sometimes, whenever, depending on what they were praying about, sometimes they would beat their breasts, you know. Um, they would tear their clothes. They would throw up dust and ashes in the air. Maybe, maybe to emphasize the sorrow that they were going through at that moment in time. So all these things would come into play there. And, and so as you, whenever you start looking at and go back and read through extra, extra, extra biblical literature, in other words, some of the other literature at that time that was written around that time, and you might see some of these prayers, compare that with the way Jesus taught people to pray. Uh, he, he didn't follow any specific way. He was, his was non-traditional. He suggested the idea of simply talk to God. That's what it's about. And maybe that's what, that's what shocked his disciples so much because they expected something, something formally taught rather than something that just comes from faith. If we believe in God, it's going to affect our prayers. It's going to affect the way we pray. And as we think about that, we have to understand that prayer is essentially an attitude. Jesus is dealing with attitudes, not form, attitudes. And so listen to how, what he's emphasizing here. Our Father in heaven. The first thing that he's emphasizing is our attitude. And what, when we're praying, who do we need to think about? Our Father in heaven, God, who's in charge of the world. And again, that should make us stop for a few moments and think, I'm not coming into the presence of just anybody. I think about the idea sometimes that maybe if I was ever invited to the president's, uh, you know, to the White House to see the president, I'd obviously want to, my best suit on, right? And I'd want to look as good as I possibly could. And I'd watch what I'd say and how I'd say it. And all those things would come into play there. Why? Because I'm before the man that's in charge of the entire United States, you know, that, that would be something. Think about the idea, on the other hand, think about this. We are actually going to the throne room of God. We are here to worship him. Prayer is a part of worship. And so it suggests the ideal of adoration. It suggests the idea of servitude and surrender. Lord, you are Lord. You are Lord, not me. I can't be in control of my life. Lord, you are Lord. Lord, because you are my Lord, because you bought me, because I was baptized into you, and it's your son's blood that paid the price for the penalty for my sins. Lord, you bought me from sin. I owe you my life, not just my spiritual life, Lord, but everything in my life, my family, job that I have, what I do on a day-by-day -day basis, Lord, I owe you everything. So he says unto him, 
Father in heaven, hallowed, honor, respect. We respect your name. It, the name of God represents who he is. Notice also Jesus calls him Father. He's not only the God of heaven and earth that created the heavens and the earth, that keeps everything going, but he also wants us to know that God is our Father. And just as a father disciplines his children, just as a father loves his children, despite the numerous times they let him down, they disappoint him, despite the fact that we disappoint him by our failures, by our sins, he still wants us to call him Father. In the book of Psalms, the psalmist would write, he knows that we're just dust. He knows our weaknesses. He knows our struggles. He knows our pains. He knows our heartaches. He knows us better than we'll know about ourselves because, and I often think about this, he knows when I'm going to draw the last breath on earth. I don't have a clue about that. And so the thing that I want to continue to think about is what Jesus is, he's teaching them to pray. And this is kind of the, what we call the Lord's Prayer. This is kind of a form. I, I like to say John 17 is really the Lord's Prayer. And when you compare this prayer with what you read in John 17, you see, wow, you see a whole, a whole nother level of prayer. But he's trying to teach them, Father, you're in heaven. We're here on this earth. We, we are dealing with everything we've got to deal with here. But Lord, hallowed be your name. You're in charge. Lord, we need this relationship with you. And as Dwayne just pointed out a moment ago, it implies someone we have familiarity and a relationship with. He's not so far off that we can't know him. How well, and I think about this a lot too, how well did we know our parents when they were, we were growing up? At first, they loved us and all, and then they disciplined us. And then they tried to teach us. And a lot of times we'd walk off and we'd say, well, I don't care what they did. I, you know, life's changed and the world's changed. And I tell you what, it's just to the point now, I'm going to do what I want to do. And then we wind up, and you may have heard the idea years ago that says, you know, whenever our, we're one or two or three years old, our dad can do anything. And, and then whenever we're 15 or 16, my dad doesn't have a brain in his head. And then whenever we're 40 or 50, we begin to realize just how smart he got in the last 20 years. And then when he's gone, we wish we could talk to him again. Our Heavenly Father knows more about me than I ever will. And he says, I want you to talk to him like he's your father. Our Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom, Lord. Your kingdom come. Let it come into my life. Now, when we think about the idea of the kingdom come, is this talking about the church? Obviously, we do know the idea that, that later this does become part of the kingdom. Matthew chapter 16, he talks about the kingdom of God. I'll give unto you, Peter, the keys of the kingdom of heaven. So all those things come into play there. But it also could suggest the idea, not just the church, but also the idea of the kingdom of God coming into my life. In other words, Lord, you are the lawgiver. You are the one that's given me what I need to do and how I need to live. Lord, help me to live by your law. Help me to live by your precepts. Read through Psalms 119, the longest chapter in the Bible, and see how the psalmist praises God's word and how he emphasizes over and over and over again the importance of listening, hearing, keeping it. So he's saying, Lord, your kingdom, let it come into my life. Let me make your kingdom first. Lord, this is what we really need. Then he says this, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I often think about the fact, as you read through the Old Testament, where God will give it a command to an angel, and boom, it's done. They just, they take care of it right then and there on the spot. It's not like, well, Lord, I'll take care of that a little bit later on after I get this other stuff. No, 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 no. These angels, they go and they get it done. What if we did God's will just that way? Lord, I know. Lord, I know. And so as we go closer to God, Betty's bringing out this idea, our prayers come for our inner soul, and this is very powerful. 
And again, this is why the kingdom needs to come into our hearts. So this is a very good point, Betty, and I appreciate that, is the idea that, that the more his kingdom, the more his law, the more his love is manifested in our lives, the more it becomes important to us. So he then goes on and says this, give us this day our day, our day by day, our daily bread. Now, I want to emphasize something to you here, and I think all of us understand this. They didn't go down to the local Kroger and buy groceries for a week. They did not have freezers. They did not have refrigerators. They did not have anything that keeps food to the point that it does. They literally, literally led, or <clears throat> they actually led their lives day by day. They would have to go out every day in the marketplace and buy what was necessary, fresh fish or whatever else was out there. And, and the bottom line is they had to literally feed themselves and be concerned day by day about what they were going to eat. I think this idea emphasizes our complete daily trust for the physical things that we need in this life. You know, and, and, and we've got to realize this, we can live without electricity. We can live without computers. We can live without a lot of stuff. I need to have a, a meal a day at least to make it. I have to be able to get out there and get whatever I need to do to have that meal for a day. Daily trust in God. I think sometimes the way we live our lives and in our culture and the way we put everything else, <laughs> I like that, Dwayne, appreciate that. Don't say cell phones. Yeah, we can live without our cell phones too, brothers and sisters. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? The bottom line I'm trying to get across to you is, is in those days, they literally led hand to mouth day by day, going in, getting something to eat, and that was it. Daily trust in God. Do we have that daily trust? Do we have that thankfulness? Whenever they thank God, it was not just a day of thanksgiving at one time of the year, but they thank God every day. Every blessing that we have is a gift from God. Every blessing. Whenever we complain about our cars because we got to get it fixed, it's still a blessing. It's still a blessing. Whenever we complain because we can't get gas for our cars, guess what? We've still got a blessing here. We've still got a blessing. You know, I often think about the fact, what would happen if this country did collapse? What would we do? Would there be chaos and riots? Would there be everybody fending for themselves? Would we be acting like a pack of animals? Or would we try to be what God wants and expects of us to be? All these things come into play there. We need to look at every blessing as a gift from God every day of our life, our lives themselves. Another day to spend with my wife my children, my grandchildren. Another day to text and let them know that I'm thinking about them. Another day to call them. Another day to encourage them. All of these things come into play there. Give us day by day our daily bread and forgive us our sins. Oh, oh, you know, we need to come before God every day with a spirit of repentance. Lord, I've often read this prayer It suggests the idea that one guy every morning before he got up, he would say, Lord, um, thank you for letting me make it through the night. And Lord, today there's going to be some things that happen that I don't even know what's going to happen. Lord, I'm going to need your help all day long. So if you don't mind too terribly, walk, walk with me every day, all, every step of the way. And again, think about how important that is. And think about how maybe if we started off our days with that kind of prayer, maybe we would be more cognizant of the things that we might do that might be a sin against sin. Lord, you know what, today there's going to be some folks out there that's going to disagree with me, and they might be a little bit disagreeable. Lord, don't let me be that way. Lord, you know, they might maybe want to say something I shouldn't say. That guy just cut me off in traffic, Lord. Help me, help me, Lord, not just, not just not to say it, but not to think it, you know, on and on and on we could go. Forgive us our sins. We must live in God's presence every day, acknowledging that we sin, 
and we seek God's forgiveness. And again, we do it on the basis of our faith in the blood of Jesus. Our faith in the blood of Jesus. It's not like, Lord, I'm going to do better on this. Now, you know, we could set that goal, but have you ever thought about the idea? You remember in the movie Gone with the Wind? <clears throat> uh, what was the heroine's name? I can't remember her name. Just went blank, but that's okay. But she'll just say over and over again, I'm not going to think about that today, right? And there's a lot of things we don't want to think about today. But you know what? We, we've got to. We need to live and, and think about what Jesus did. Scarlet, thank you. Thank you. Scarlet O'Hara. I knew it was O'Hara or something, but anyway. Yeah, we've got to think about it. We've got to think about what our relationship is with God. And Lord, more importantly, I, I, I pray that that you would help me, what? Notice what it goes on, it says here, for we also forgive everyone who is indebted to us. One of the things that God makes very clear, Jesus makes very clear in this passage and in other passages is that if we are not willing to forgive someone else, we will not be forgiven. If we are not willing to forgive someone else, we will not be forgiven. And that necessarily means that, that I have to have the Father's heart. For me to forgive somebody that sins and trespasses against me, that means I've got to have his heart, that heart of compassion, that heart that realizes that that person that has sinned against me may be having a hard day. Maybe they cut me off in traffic. Maybe they're rushing to the hospital. I don't know. I need to give them the benefit of the doubt and not take it personal and not sit back there and think that they're out there just to get me. I need to think about it from the viewpoint that I sin and everybody else is going to sin. And again, I don't know what burdens people are going through. I don't know what problems they're having. I don't know what's in a person's heart. And so the thing that we have to do is, is we have to have this attitude that, that I'm going to forgive. Jada asked the question, do, does the person have to ask for forgiveness? Well, I think that that's vital because Matthew 18 says this. He said, if you uh, have sinned against a brother, you go into, or if somebody has sinned against you, you go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. In other words, whenever there's sin, whenever there's the situation, then what you need to do is you need to work through it so that you can restore the relationship. God, in sending his son to die upon the cross, worked through the sins of mankind to bring about the salvation for mankind. When Jesus was nailed to the cross, they were sinning against him, but he used that very thing to save us. Yes, Matthew 18 emphasizes the idea that if I have something against somebody, if it's just between me and him, I need to talk to them. That's it. It doesn't need to go no further. And once at that point in time, when there's been forgiveness, when they're, when there's going on, but then if, if they choose not to, for, to, to ask for forgiveness, then you take two or three more. And then if they choose not to, you tell it to the church. And then if they choose not to, what? Then you treat him as a heathen man and as a publican. God has given us a way to do that. Let's also be honest, in the church, we don't do that because we're afraid that we're going to hurt somebody's feelings or, more importantly, we're afraid. And, and you see, there's an animosity that's going on and continues to go on. And every time you see that person, if you've not worked that problem out, you're going to think about what's going on. I believe it has caused a lot of Christians to not be able to worship at all. Oh, they may sing the songs. They may go through the motions. But if they're sitting across the room from somebody that they don't like because that person has done something to them and they've not worked it out, there's no worshiping going on. So you see, it's a very important thing. Yeah, if we want to be forgiven, we have to forgive. Now, going back to Jada's question, which is a very, very good question, if they don't ask for forgiveness, maybe number one, maybe they don't even realize they've offended you. Okay. And in that situation, that's why you need to go to them first. Okay, did you know that you, you did this and it kind of, kind of uh, 
it didn't sit well with me and I think that you, you need to repent. And if they say, well, you know, I, I didn't know it. You know, as a preacher sometimes, and, and, and as a human being sometimes, I say things without even thinking about my, who might be hearing it. And then I find out four or five months later, somebody got offended about it. Okay, well, why didn't they come talk to me about it? Why didn't they share with me their ideas, their thoughts? Their, but, but see, they didn't do that. And so I've been thinking everything's fine and didn't know what, didn't know that, that there was a problem. The bottom line is, is what we're talking about here is that if we want to be forgiven by God, we have to forgive those who sin against us. And if somebody has done something against us and it's bothering us, you need to go and talk to that person alone. Matthew 18. Do it the Bible way. Then if that don't work, take two or three more. If that doesn't work, then bring them before the church. And what's the whole purpose in all of it? It's not to disfellowship them. It's to bring them back into the right relationship that they need to have with you and with God. Because if that person has sinned against you, they have sinned against God as well. Perhaps if we thought, yeah, brother. Hey, Tommy, here's a thought. You know, because we sin every day and, and we don't always ask God for forgiveness, but does he, is he still exercising his mercy toward us, right? I, I and, believe that he does. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. I and, believe and that he does. He does. And I think he's trying to give us a chance to where we come to that knowledge and understanding to confess and to forgive, right? Now, right. what if someone dies, say someone hurts me or trespasses against me and they die before they ask for forgiveness? I think looking at what this passage is telling us, we still forgive them whether they ask for it or not, because it's a condition by which we want to have the same from God, right? And the forgiveness is not for the person, the forgiveness is for us so that we stay in good relationship with God. Now, if the person never asks for forgiveness and they do pass away, that's not our burden to carry, um, I believe. I believe you know, that can be reconciled with God when, when Jesus says, you know, cast your cares upon me, those are those cares we, we, we cast on Christ to help us to get through those times. But that forgiveness is really for us. And I think sometimes we we are holding on to things and we are not releasing things and we're carrying someone else's baggage, burden, baggage yeah. that we shouldn't be carrying, right? That's not what right. God wants us to do. He wants us to, to live in his mercy, live in his forgiveness and be able to exercise the same to others. Just, just a thought. And I think that's important. Our forgiveness is vital to obtain the forgiveness from God, but it's also vital to, you know, again, if I've offended you in some way and don't even realize it, you're not doing me any favors by letting me walk around not knowing about it. You're not helping me to be what I need to be spiritually in, in that respect. Now, again, I wanna think about this in, in another respect too. Jesus, a lot of times, offended a lot of people. Amen. He didn't pull any punches with them. But why? He said what he said out of love. He said what he said in the hopes of maybe shaking them up to the point to realize that this is what they need to do. So yes, those hard conversations need to be had. But I do agree with you to 100% Dwayne, that forgiveness is also uh, more for us and the fact that we're letting it go. We're not carrying that burden around. We're not carrying that baggage. I've got plenty of baggage enough on my own without carrying somebody else's baggage on so how somebody else has offended me all the time. And that's, that's a thing that comes into play. But I'm not doing that other person any favors by ignoring it or sitting back and saying, okay, uh, I'm just going to let it ride. Because if he didn't know that he did something wrong, he didn't know that he offended me in this respect, he may do the same thing to somebody else and to somebody else. And he may turn up into being a habit that he doesn't even realize what he's doing. 
the, it's hard to work through that because it takes patience. It takes swallowing our pride. It takes loving that person enough to say, okay, this is what you've done. And, and uh, I, I want to work it out. And, you know, I've heard somebody tell this story too, and I love it. And as we just get off, as we, as we're still talking about this whole idea of a prayer, I remember one time I read about a guy that had, um, had been offended by another man. And this other man did not even have a clue what he had done. He did not even have a clue that he had sinned against this brother in any way. And so that brother that had been sinned against came and talked to him and said, look, we need to talk. You did this. And, 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 and it's been bothering me to the point to where I've got to deal with it. You know, I, I need you to help me. I, I need to tell you exactly what's going on. And the brother who had sinned against him, who did not even know, who did not even have a clue. So, well, okay. But before we do that, let's, let's get God in the mix. Let's pray about it. And they prayed first. And then he looked at the brother. He said, okay, brother, tell me, what is it that I've done? And what can I do to help, to help make amends? And the brother was sitting there and he thought about it. And he said, well, this is what you did. But, you know, as I look at it now, because God is here too, it's not really that big a deal. And maybe I shouldn't have been so upset about it. So you see reconciliation happen. Reconciliation happened between the two. One guy didn't even know nothing about it. Reconciliation happened between all three of them and God. And that's exactly what God wanted. And that's exactly what God meant for it to have happen. So think about how when Jesus gives us these kind of commands, Matthew 18, he's given it to us, not for us to sit back and say, well, that applies to everybody else but me. He's saying that this is the way you handle these problems. And listen, we're living in a world of sin. There's going to be some problems. There's going to be people that are going to offend us. There's going to be people that we might offend. We may not even realize it. We may not even know it. We may not even do it. We don't know what that other person's going through. We don't know what that other person, what made him act that way or her act that way at that moment in time. Maybe if I sat down and talk with them. And again, notice something else. Matthew brings out the idea. If he says this in Matthew 5. Matthew 18, he says, if someone sins against you, you go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. In Matthew 5, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, if you know that you sinned against someone, leave your offering at the altar, go and make amends with that brother. And I've often said, I've often quoted, he said, hopefully, maybe you can meet one another in the middle. You can get it worked out so that you can worship God like you need to, and so that you can restore the relationship that is so vital to help us to get to heaven together. I think, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of this, and I think this is the reason why Jesus is teaching us this. We need one another in the church. It's got to be more than just the Sundays and the Wednesdays. We, I, I need, if I have a problem, I need to know that I can come talk to you about it without you judging me. And at the same time, maybe you can give me some things that might help me in my life, whatever thing that I'm doing that's wrong. Sometimes I may need you to be blunt with me. Sometimes I may need you to sit down with me and say the prayer. We always need to pray together, amen? The thing that I'm trying to challenge us to do is that if we're going to follow Jesus' word, sometimes it's not that. Somehow or another, I got unmuted, and I'm the host. <laughs> the host just muted me. <laughs> Go figure that one out. Anyway, we're going to stop there. I want you to think about some of these things. We'll pick up with this last part. Do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Maybe that's the best thing we could do and close this lesson out tonight. How? I don't know about you, but every day I need to be praying, God, keep me from temptations. Keep me from those things that's going to cause me possibly to sin. Father, help me not to walk down that road 
What if we all prayed that way? You know, again, how often do we really, really say those kind of prayers and, and, and ask God for God's help? This is, this is something that we really need to spend a lot more time talking about. And again, it's something that I need to have an attitude of it, even if they don't come and talk to me about it. I need to have the attitude that I'm going to try to forgive them, much like Jesus did on the cross. Listen, he told them, forgive, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. But it was still contingent upon what? Them coming to Christ, right? The only way they were ever going to be saved is if they came to Christ. Jesus didn't offer a blanket forgiveness to everybody at the cross. They had to make their decisions. And so must we. Let's close with a word of prayer. Father, I'm thankful to you for giving us this opportunity to study these, these very important things. Sometimes, Father, we don't study them enough. Sometimes, Lord, we think we've got it all figured out. Sometimes we struggle so hard to live your word. Sometimes we don't do things the way you told us to because, Lord, we don't want the possible repercussions. We think we're keeping the peace, Lord, when it may just be creating even more problems. Father, your son came to show us how to live. And your son came to teach us how to pray. And Father, we thank you for the fact that you are our father. That you, can, that you love us more than we could ever possibly imagine. That you let us go through the world so that we can become stronger and help others to know you. Father, we need you every day of our lives. Not just right whenever we're about to eat. We need you every day. Walk with us. But more importantly, Father, let us walk with you. Be with the church at South Cobb. Be with all of us, Father, as we strive to do your will. Help us, Lord. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All righty. Now you can unmute yourselves and share with everybody whatever you want to share. And I've got to stop the recording. <laughs>